you, Lord, tonight for the opportunity to gather in the house of God. Lord, as we gather around thy word to study together, Lord, I pray, God, we rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, help us to say nothing that's not according to thy will tonight. Lord, I pray that, uh, the, uh, Lord, the devil would not be allowed to confuse us on any matter. Lord, we just pray you'd rebuke him from around us. Lord, I pray for these objects of prayer. God, many sick folks tonight that need a touch of God on them. I pray that you touch them. I pray for the lost world around us. God, that you let us be a light in this community to shine to others. Lord, for what you'll do for us now, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter Revelation chapter number 4. Revelation chapter number 4. Now, in my attempts to, to teach and preach this, uh, I want to do it in a manner that I've, I've said before that will be easy for us to understand and that we get the grasp of the scripture without getting into such minute detail that it, you know, that it can sometimes be confusing. Uh, so tonight we're going to try to cover most of the entire chapter, uh, chapter number four. And we remember now, I think every, people that I've asked seem to be pretty much, uh, you know, pretty much, have pretty much knowledge of what we've uh, talked about up to this point, who the seven churches are, the seven church ages, uh, the uh, remnant of people that have come through those uh, church ages. And today in the churches we see sometimes similarities in, in, in many churches about all these different church ages. Uh, but we also learned that we're in the last days of the Laodicean church age. And this is being the last age before the rapture of the church. And so we believe that. So uh, last week or, or the last time we gave you a little broader outline of the scripture last Wednesday night, I believe. And then uh, tonight we look at the scene in heaven. And uh, John saw this. And as John saw this scene, as he looked at this he beheld what one day you and I will behold and when what we'll see when we get to heaven you ever thought about what the first thing is you'll see when you get to heaven well truly it's going to be the the Lamb of God uh, that'll be the first thing you see when you get to heaven it's going to be the throne of God the Lamb of God and uh, he sits in a place of authority so I'm going to read along here and then I'm going to give you uh, some you know not quite verse by verse, but explain some things that I think will be a help uh, to you tonight. John said, after this I looked, and behold, a door was open. Remember, a door was closed, uh, and then a door is open. So he's standing in an open door now. A door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The last part of, of the... Uh, breaking breaking scripture the last part of this is that when he saw he said i i, I show you the things which uh, were the things which are and the things which are to come so now from chapter four on we're seeing the things which are to come so we're in the last section even though it's just a fourth chapter we're in the last section of the book when he says we'll see show you things which must shortly which must be hereafter and immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that was sat was he that sat was to look upon like a jasper, and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Now picture all of this in your mind. Now John saw this. He he is the uh, person in Scripture that had an out of body experience, uh, which his spirit went in to the throne room of God, God led him away and let him see this, open the doors of heaven and let him look in. And as John could look into these things, uh, John couldn't go in physically, neither could you and I go in physically as we are because we do not have a glorified body. Our bodies could not take it. Our eyes could not behold such beauty as we're going to see. And, and our, our, our finite minds could not hold what we see as, as far as the description of what it is. So we're given just a glimpse of it here in Scripture to know what we're going to see when we first get into heaven, uh, what, we're, what we're going to see. So John, here in verse number 1, John hears the uh, voice of, of Jesus, and then he is, as he is observing, there's a throne set in heaven, and Jesus is described as sitting on that throne. 
And this is a, a throne that is, notice what the Bible says, a throne set in heaven. Now, you, you know what you do when you pour concrete on the ground or, or, or pour a slab or a concrete sidewalk? What do you wait for? You wait for it to set. You know why? Because after it sets, it's there. Now, it is movable, but the best way I can describe that to you is is before that was there, you know, uh, there was dirt there and it was easily moved. But when that, when that cement, that concrete is set, then it's there. Now, all through the centuries, there have been thrones that have risen and thrones that have fallen. There have been nations that have risen and nations that have fallen. Uh, there's been all kinds of of, of things that have risen and, and fell in, this, in the history of mankind. But this is a throne that is set in heaven. It'll never be moved. Amen? It'll never be moved. It'll never be changed. It is a throne set in heaven uh, for all eternity. It is unmovable, and it's also undefeatable. God's throne is, is uh, in heaven. It, he, it is always settled in heaven. And it is never going to be defeated. And so, friend, that is, that is the scene that John is looking at when, when we see this throne. Then we see that it is the, the, the center. The throne is the center of the heavenly setting. Uh, in the center of heaven, somewhere in the northern parts, the Bible tells us, in the center of heaven, we see the throne of God. Why? Because he, he the, being the center, that's a symbol of Christ's universal government where he rules and reigns the entirety of what is out there. Now, I understand that our little thing we sent up, I told you all about that, I guess Wednesday night, that little thing we sent up there, uh, that Martian, no, it was, it was just that Voyager, that thing that went out into space has done gone beyond our, our universe and it's gone way out into... Uh, what they call it, inter, interlinear space or something. It's way out there farther than you and I can drive in a couple of days. And millions of miles out there, it said it has now left our universe and going beyond and still sending back signals. And what are they hoping to find? What are they hoping to see out there? I don't know. Why are we doing it? I don't know. But I got news for these people. You know, it's interesting to me. I mean, it's interesting to look at the stars. And, and I like that. I like, you know, I like seeing what's going on and, and all that's interesting to me, but I got news for these people. One of these days, I'm going to see it all. Amen. One of these days, I'm going to walk it all, and I'm going to understand everything that's out there. And uh, I don't want to have to rely on some machine out there. I'm going to do it myself. Amen. Because Jesus is the center, because his throne is set in heaven. He is the central of all the heaven, <clears throat> the central thing, <clears throat> the central government, and everything that's ruled will be ruled by him. So as you imagine yourself, as, as uh, you step into heaven, as John stepped into heaven, he saw the throne of God. And on that throne, he saw that uh, Jesus, he, he was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. Now, if you look over in the book of Exodus, now I'm not going to turn there, but if you look over in the book of Exodus, chapter number 12, I believe it is, uh, you will find a description of the breastplate upon the the priest's garment, and in those was included the, uh, these two stones. Those two stones were included in that, uh, in that breastplate. And so they have some, some significant meaning. These two stones symbolize the glory and the majesty of God. These two stones do. That's why, that's why it is important in Scripture that when we see this, that we understand that, that it's, not, you know, it's not just there, but it, it, it explains to us what the, the majesty and the glory of God is. The jasper stone and the sardine stone are mentioned in, yeah, Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus 28. I had it in my notes and couldn't find it, but it's Exodus 28, 17, 17 through 20. We find that these two stones are mentioned, and they're, uh, Gore said, in the breastplate of the high priest. These two stones symbolize the splendor and glory of God. The jasper stone is clear as crystal, like Christ is without spot and without blemish. And so it's a stone on the breastplate that is clear as crystal. And then the sardine stone is blood red. 
And that speaks to us of the blood that Jesus shed for us, the sacrifice that was shed for us. And they point to, these two stones point to also to the first and second coming of Christ because one of them was at the, uh, one of them was the first stone on the breastplate, the other was the last stone. So it points to the first and second coming of Christ. So it's, you know, these things are important. As God, God does not uh, use words in Scripture uh, just to take up space. They all have a meaning. They all have something that uh, is important to us. So we see the jasper stone, clear as crystal, uh, pointing to the Lamb of God without spot or blemish. And then we see the sardine stone, which in the, in the Old Testament called the sardis stone, uh, it, is, it is said to be blood red as the blood of Christ was shed for you and I. Now, you picture that, and that is what John saw. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now, uh, there's a picture back there in the foyer Brother Frank took of a rainbow, over the church. It's a partial rainbow. A uh, true rainbow is truly a circle. It's a, it's a, a circular. It's called a, you know, because it's, we only see half of it when we look at a rainbow. We only see half. But John's looking in and he sees the throne of God. And he sees one likened to, uh, you know, like the jasper stone and the sardine stone. He sees that sitting on the throne. And as he sees that, he also sees the throne and a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Now, I don't see anything in here that's emerald colored, that green, that soft green color. And I'm about half colorblind anyway, so I probably wouldn't recognize if I did see it. But, but when you think of, of that soft green color, God colored the earth mostly with green vegetation. You understand? It's mostly green vegetation that God covered the earth with. Why? Because it has a natural uh, appeal, it has a, a natural softness to it. And the throne of God is encircled with a rainbow that is like an emerald. Now, can you picture that in your mind, that aura of a, of a rainbow, of a, of a natural emerald color that encircles that throne? What a beauty, what a sight that must be to behold is when we see that, that uh, sight in heaven there as we step into the throne of God. Boy, I can, it makes me homesick, makes me want to go, makes me want to see it. And friend, as we preach this morning, we're a heartbeat away from eternity. And any, any one of us here tonight could see that. If, if we leave this world, uh, we could see that. But the, we see that that rainbow is, it, it, the color of that rainbow represents uh, eternal freshness. And that's why, you know, the green grass grows and uh, it, it's, it's fresh. And you see it spring up in the spring and it's fresh. And that Rainbow, that green-colored rainbow, it, it represents eternal freshness. And also, uh, in the Old Testament days, and, and maybe even so today, I don't know, but that, that emerald was chosen as a wedding stone. And you will use a diamond today many times for, uh, you know, for engagements. That's what's normally given. But then they would use that emerald stone, a precious stone, and they would use that emerald stone. So it's a, it's a, a, a very, it's something to think about when you picture yourself, as John did, as John saw it. He saw the heavens open, and what he saw was Christ sitting upon a throne, and uh, he was sitting upon that throne in a, in a, a green bow about that throne. And man, what a, sight, what a sight of beauty that must be to behold. Now, that's not all that he saw. The... Uh, as he saw that rainbow, we understand that that rainbow also is a circle, and it represents the unbroken power and the mercy and the love of God. Now, we put on a wedding ring, and that's to represent the, uh, the, the love, the unending love that we have for that one that we're to marry or that one that we've married. That's what the, the ring is for, unending love. Uh, the circle of, well, that circle of a rainbow around the throne of God represents God's unending love for you and I. And see, it's all going to be there before us as we see that red stone uh, and that sardine stone that's a red stone. We'll think of the blood of Christ and we'll see that clear crystal stone and we'll think of the salvation uh, that God has given us 
And uh, when we see that rainbow, we're going to think of the unending, dying love of Christ that he gave for you and I. Through eternity, uh, that's what will be fresh on our minds. Then we see in verse 4 and 5, we see the elders. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now these 24 elders, I believe, to as my studying has gone, uh, it seems that they are, are to represent uh, the church after the rapture. And that's where we're going to be first. If I'm saved in the grace of God, which I am, if I'm a member of the body of Christ, which I am, if you're a member of the body of Christ, when we step into heaven, we are going to immediately behold the glory of God and we're going to encircle the throne of God for the purpose of praising him. Now, friend, that, you, know, you say, why would we do that? Look what he's done for us. He is the reason that we're going to get to go there. He is the, re he is the only way that we're going to get there is through his undying love for us and uh, his eternal love for us and his bloodshed for us. That's the only way we're going to get there. And so these 24 elders, they represent the, uh, the, the church after the rapture around God's throne and the crowns of gold represent the royal dignity uh, the white garments represent righteousness and holiness. And so we see this. What did he see? 20, uh, 20 seats, and upon the seats I saw four, four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now we see that. We see the church in those 24 elders. We see the bride of Christ. And we see the, the white raiment being the righteousness of Christ imparted to us. Now there's no righteousness in me. But because I've been saved and been covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we get to heaven we'll wear robes of white righteousness because we've been made righteous through him. And so it's very, see the, the word of God if we take it for what it is and the revelation if we take it for what it is with a little explaining uh, we, can, we can understand exactly what it's saying to us. So there's the scene set in heaven, partially what we'll see when we get there. Then we see that the, these, uh, uh, the next thing we see here, and out of the throne uh, proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of, bur of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now out of the throne we hear of lightnings and thunderings that these speak of the power of God in judgment. Now, friend, we know that God, you know, is, is, going to, is the great judge. And those lightnings and those thunderings that come from the throne of God speak of God's judgment and the judgment to come upon uh, the earth and upon the devil and upon all the things that the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon. Now, that's what the lightnings and the thunderings represent as he will soon judge the world. We Next we see... And verse 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now here's where it seems to get complicated for people when we start talking about the beasts. And, but, but they're all representative. And, uh, you know, we take them as, as what they are and what they represent. So they're all representative. And these, uh, uh, we, feed, we see first here the sea of glass, that is clear and calm. Now, when we see the ocean, when we see the sea, I've seen the Mediterranean Sea even. Uh, sometimes I've seen the ocean that looked like you could lay on it just about because it was so calm. You know, I, you, you look out there and it just looks like there's not a wave on it. And then I've seen it at times where, where the waves were, uh, you know, were real high and then way out as far as you could see, it was white capping because the the tempest had come, the winds were blowing, the storm had come, and it was a, a constant change in the sea. Now, while we were on the Mediterranean Sea over in Israel, uh, we started out and the sea was a little rough, but by the time we got out in the middle of the sea, the, it was real rough, and we had, to, you know, we had to park the boat and go by bus the rest of the way because of the tempest of the a storm upon the sea. And that, that's the way... Life is for us. Sometimes we have a rough ride. Sometimes it's calm. And sometimes uh, things are, uh, will be calm for a while. Then a storm will come along and our life is roughened up. 
But here in heaven we see a, a sea of glass likened to crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So uh, the, as the sea represents a calmness, a clearness, where there's no storms, no winds, and no waves. Friend, that's what we're going to see when we get to glory. When we get to God, we see God on his throne. We see that rainbow about the throne of God. We see the church around the throne of God. And, and the church is praising him. We'll know, friend, when we look at that sea of glass, that like crystal, when we see that and it, how, how slick it is, how calm it is, friend, that's what it's going to be for us through all eternity. Never no more worries, never no more storms, never no more troubles, never nothing to come along and disrupt our lives with Christ by his side for all eternity. Man, that's good. Amen. That's, that's good stuff to me. I'm, you know, I've been going through some difficulties for a while and uh, but there's coming a day when there's not going to be any difficulties, amen? You may have been going through some storms here for a little while and, and some dark places and seems like some struggles, but hallelujah, there's coming a day when we're going to be around that sea of glass and it's going to remind us for all eternity there's no more storms, there's no more rough places, uh, there's no more shipwrecks, none of that because we are around the throne of God. So we see here that these uh, that these, uh, after these storms, we, we see in here the four beasts. Uh, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal in the midst of the throne. And round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now all this is representative. We see that the first beast, <clears throat> and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like an eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And that's their job through eternity, these beasts. Now, what do these four beasts represent? They represent, the lion represents the, the, uh, the majesty and power of God. That's what that lion represents, the majesty and power of God. Uh, friend, God, we know God is all-powerful, is he not? And we know that, that God speaks with authority. And we know that, that Jesus was uh, uh, the most powerful man in flesh that has ever lived. And so that lion, that beast of the lion, represents the power of God and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The calf, it represents the humility and patience of Christ. That's, a, that's what the calf represents. A calf is a, or, a, or an ox is a beast of burden. And it's a beast of labor. And that's what that represents. Yet there'll be no, no earthly labors for us any longer. And we see in this that, that uh, the, the calf, was as, as Christ was full of humility... And full of patience, the most humble man that ever walked planet earth was Christ. And so we see that the calf represents the, the humility. We see in that. Then the face of a man. We see in that the highest. As we look, we'll see the face of a man. And that represents the highest of God's creation. God created the heavens. God created the earth. God spoke God spoke uh, the planets and all that into existence. He caused by his word the grass to grow. And, and uh, all of these things God spoke and it happened. But when it came to making man, God formed him with his own hand out of the dust of the earth. And into his nostrils he breathed the breath of life. We are the highest of God's creation. And we didn't come here through an amoeba that come out of a muddy pond somewhere and growed up into what we are. Now, I may look like that, but that ain't what happened, amen? But we're created in the likeness of him, and we are the highest of God's creation. See, we're far greater than the animal life. We're far greater than the animal kingdom. And God put us here that we would rule over those things here in this life. We are the highest of God's creation. So the face of a man, that beast with, as had the face of a man, represents the, the highest creation of mankind, which we are and which we're going to be in eternity with the Lord. Oh, what a blessing it is. And then we, 
uh, see that this eagle, we see it as, as the wisest of all birds. He flies the highest. He has the best eyesight and is very swift to act. We see that in the, in the, around the throne of God. We see the, uh, the, the swiftness of the eagle in Christ. He, he's the one that flies the highest, and he has the best, the best sight. And, friend, that is to behold, uh, and that is to behold when we get to heaven. Jesus is all-powerful. He's most humble, the most humble man, and he sees everything. See, these beasts, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within and, and without, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So we see here that day and night, with eyes that see all, and even as God sees all today, don't ever forget that God sees all today, as we see this, we'll be there in heaven, and these beasts will be forever praising the Lord, saying, holy, holy, holy. Why? Because God is, is just and right, and God deserves worship. And so they cease not day and night to say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, this is what John saw, and this, as best as I can determine, is what this represents. And all of it centers around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring it all together. He is there on the throne. The, the, the beasts around him are saying, holy, holy, holy. The 24 elders are there about the throne praising him and giving him worship. And we see Jesus for who he is with eyes on everything, knowing all knowledge, knowing everything. He's omniscient, he's omnipresent, and he's omnipotent. All in one is my God in heaven. And then with the rest of these verses, we'll read them through to you, maybe, maybe uh, comment maybe the next time. And when these beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. Now that's what the beasts are doing. They're giving glory and honor to him that liveth forever and ever. Now this is what John's looking at. Put your place, yourself in the place of John. Use your imagination that we all have and pitch, try to picture in your mind what John is seeing. And friend, you remember, that's what you're going to see one day. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord. Now the golden crowns that were on the head, that's what, they'll, that's what will be cast at the feet of the Savior. So there we see even more uh, that the twenty-four elders are the church with crowns on their heads that will cast at the feet of the Savior. And what a blessing, amen, what a blessing it'll be to take that day and cast our crowns and forever sing his praises and forever sing his glory. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. It's just simply, friend, a worship of the Creator. It's simply a worship of, of the Lord God Almighty. And that's what John sees. If you're fixed this far, that's what John sees when he steps into heaven. These are the things that he sees. And, and what is most prominent in these verses is Christ on the throne. And everything else is beneath him. Everything else is, is worshiping him because he is preeminent in, the, in heaven. That, that's, he is the one. He's the most high. He's the most holy. And that's what you and I will get to envision when we get to heaven. Now, have I confused anybody tonight? Nod your head no if I haven't. Does everybody pretty much understand what we're trying to say? Nod your heads like this. Now, if you don't, come to me after the service and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it some more. But, but it's, I see it, and, but sometimes it's hard for me to get it out exactly, exactly like I see it. When I was studying, I got real excited Amen, about the things that I'm going to see when I get to glory. And if I can just get you to see a little bit of that, amen, uh, we're liable to shout it out before this is over, knowing that where we're going to be. Now, remember, as we study on, remember all of what I'm teaching to you now or preaching to you now is in heaven. But there's still things going on on earth. And so we'll be studying that also as we go along. Anybody have anything now before we dismiss?